Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 8 of the basic series of my assembly programming tutorials and we're going to be looking at some programming techniques today that I think it's worth you bearing in mind in. If you're looking at programming in assembly, you won't need them in the early days, but if you're looking to create a more complicated program, I think these are things that you should know about and some of them are terminology you might hear thrown around the place and um, you, know, you will need to know what they are. The first one we're going to be discussing is the concept of a lookup table. Well, what is a lookup table? Well, it's a table of values that you look up pretty easy really and we actually um, discussed briefly last time. Last time we looked at a line code and I discussed how you could create a 256 byte lookup table of values that you could use to pre-calculate the flipping of byte values for transferring bitmap data to the screen or for removing backgrounds or inverting graphics things like that and lookup tables that is certainly a form of lookup table but lookup tables can do a lot of other things as well I mean really as many things as you can imagine but um, some of the ones that it's certainly worth you considering I thought we'd have a quick look at here now here is the sample code from a program I wrote once before for, and this had um, procedurally generated, um, it was um, stock charts, it was a sort of stock simulation type game. And so um, there were various patterns that were combined together to, to define the movements of the values of the stocks over time. And so I was switching between multiple combinations of multiple of these tables. And because each of these tables had 16 entries, it was easy to interchange between them and to get changes over time depending on the effects that I want. Now a very common thing you might want to do is you might want to create a table of sine values to represent a sine wave. That's a kind of smooth up and smooth down with a um, with a sort of cap at the top and the bottom. Very common waveform that you might want if you're doing drawing circles and things like that. Calculating these in real time not really going to be very viable and certainly not worth you trying in uh, assembly but you can create a nice lookup table of values and then read in the values from the lookup table to get the equivalent sign values. Now these are 16 entry tables but if you are sort of creating um, patterned data that moves in a sort of curve or in a linear line what you can actually do is you can sort of get a between value of the two of these add them together in 16 bits and then shift them one bit to the right effectively halving that value and that will give you the average of two values fairly quickly and so as I say even if you've only got a 16 value sign table entries you can simulate 32 by calculating a between value between each of them you could even of course create more fractions between if you so wish but as I say calculating a in between value between two values is fairly easy so as I say, I've got um, here, I've got some various things. I've got a sign table. I've got a linear value here, random numbers. Um, and then I've got some blips and things. So these, these are sort of various values. But as I say, the concept of a lookup table can really be used for anything. It can be used for data in this, like in this case, for when you're looking to um, represent the movements of things. You can have a lookup table of memory addresses for um, a sprite table, for example. If you've got um, 16 sprites, you might have the address to the bitmap data of all 16. You look up two bytes for each sprite, and then you know the destination address that you need to start transferring data from. And so a lookup tables really a, a, a pretty much infinite number of uses I'd say but um, it's just something to consider the, uh, yeah, the start thinking of the possible uses for in the game you're making. Okay another concept that I think is um, it's not really very useful in small games but in big games multi-load games especially you might want to start thinking about something known as the jump block. Well what is the jump block? Well this is something that I used in Chibi Akamas and Chibi Akamas was a multi-load game. The way the game basically worked is that there were um, three modules in, a set, in essence there was what was known as the bootstrap which was the disk operations block that was loaded in on startup of the game and that would be loaded in to the second screen buffer actually and then that would load in the core which was the main game engine and that would be loaded in at all times that core handled things like movement graphics and the, the, the game logic itself but then there was a third module which was the level data now the level data was executable in its own right so the level data had its own program code that called to the other two modules to get jobs done now the thing is that um, the core the main module that handled all of the um, all of the uh, things like drawing the sprites and things like that that would change over time new things would be added there'd be corrections made and of course the positions in memory of that block that the, uh, the things like the draw sprite routine or the re reset level routine occurred would move as the game got bigger and smaller as I optimized it and added more code so um, I didn't want to have to recompile all of the levels every time the core changed and so we what I wanted was a, a constant way of 
calling a certain task within the core code without having to worry about the address of that. And this is what a jump block is for. And jump blocks are used a lot in 8-bit um, software, for, you know, 8-bit operating system, sorry. And this is the same purpose. Certain addresses within the jump block can be called to get certain results. A certain address might print a character. A certain address might um, start the tape drive or something like that. And um, a jump block is very, very simple. All it is, is a sequence of jump commands. And these jump commands will jump to particular addresses. Now I've taken a, a, a fragment of the ones that existed in the um, Chibiakuma's jump block here, but I've just padded the, the out with return addresses just so that they can compile. Now each of these will have an address. Now this program code starts with an org 8000 statement. So the start of this code will be memory address 8000. Now the jump command itself is a single byte and the addresses are absolute addresses. So these are two bytes. So each of these commands will be three bytes. So the first command will be at memory address 8000. The second will be at 8003, third at 8006 and so on. And then what we do as part of our jump block is we just fix the addresses 8000, 8003, 8006 and their purposes. So for our test here, the memory address 8003 will be a jump to the print string command. Now the print string command is down here and that will just print a string to the screen. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to compile this into the memory of our emulator. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compile the second program at memory address 1000. And this is going to show a string to the screen by calling memory address 8003, which is the jump block entry for our print string command. So now I'll just compile this. Okay, that's now compiled as well. And if we now do call 1000, well, we've now shown our hello world message to the screen, hello world 234. And that has been done by calling memory address 8003, which jumps to this line here, which then jumps to the print string command, which is down here. Now, we've added an extra jump to that procedure. The call has, has gone to the jump. The jump has gone to the print string routine. And once the print string routine is completed, it's gone back to the start. So we've kind of wasted three ticks reading in those three bytes and performing that jump. Um, but as I say, the advantage is now that if this block of code changes, for example, let's say we move this print string command here, Let's say we move it all the way up to here and we now compile this again. Now this has now changed in memory, but because the jump block address is still the same, we can recompile this code. I've just recompiled this block part of the code, but I'm not going to recompile the first part because that first part still exists in memory and it will still call to the jump block, which is still at 8003. And although the actual code that is going to be run has changed its memory position, it still runs absolutely fine. I just need to take that out because it's repeating. And so we still got our hello world 234. So only this part of the code needed recompiling. This part did not because it's using the jump block. And as I say, a jump block is a very simple way of allowing you to separate parts of your program. If your program is very big or very complex or parts of it are being reused. In the case of my game, I was reusing the core between all of the levels. If you had some kind of game engine that you were using with multiple games, you could do the same thing. That's a very simple way of doing things. It's one that is used by all of the 8-bit operating systems really. And so it's definitely one that's worth you considering if you're writing something quite complicated. Now, the final thing we're going to look at today is relocatable code. Now, again, this is something of a complex um, concept, but it's one that's worth looking at. And there are definitely times you may need to use it if you're working with more complex programs. Now, what we're going to do here, it, we're going to do it in Z8 again, but this concept works with any system really that is capable of relative commands. So what we're going to do here is we're going to define a print string command here. Now this print string command will just do our loading characters in from our string and it will repeat using a jump relative here back to the start and it will return once the execution has completed. Now this is going to be somewhere around the memory address 1000 but what we're actually going to do is we're going to transfer it to memory address 2000 so we're going to copy the string and also the code and we're going to copy that to memory address 2000 and then we're going to call it at memory address 2000 and just so i can prove the point we're actually zeroing the brights of the original code when we do this so let's put a break here and let's put a break here and let's compile and see what happens okay so if i now do call and 1000 here so our program has now started and what this is going to do is it's going to start transferring 
the program to the new destination. Now, if I just alter this here, so you can see here, this is the program code at memory address 1000. You can see that just here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to move that in memory to 2000. We're only deleting it just to prove the point that it has been moved. So you can see now that that code has been zeroed out. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to call memory address 2000. And we've now transferred that program, relocated it to memory address 2000, and it will run just fine. And we've shown hello world 123. Okay, and that's how we've done that. And we've re relocated that to memory address 2000. So, and this routine will work fine because the only um, jump here is a relative jump. The return works fine and there's no calls. So there's no absolute addresses in this except for the call to the operating system function BB5A to print the characters here. Well, that hasn't moved, so that doesn't matter. But um, the important thing to understand here, here is that this only works if we use relative commands. If we had used an absolute command here, so instead of JR, if we'd have used JP, if we now just um, compile this again, I'll just remove these breakpoints here. If we compile this again and do a uh, call 1000 again, well, the first character shows to the screen, but then it crashes. And the reason it crashes is because this jumped print screen, print string command will actually be trying to go back to memory address 1000. If we just go to here, you can see jump print string here is now going to 101D here, which was the original address of the print string command before it was relocated and it no longer exists at that address. So if you're going to create relocatable code, you need to make sure that all your commands are relocatable. And this also applies to memory addresses of variables. Now, in this case, we're going to show a second string to the screen, but we're going to show message two, which I've actually put within this block that is relocated. Now, our assembler will not know the correct address for message two because it's going to have changed. So what I've done here is I've created a formula. So I've taken message two and I've calculated that as a relative offset from the print string block, which is the relocated block. Now that print string block is relocated to memory address 2000. So I'm adding 2000 here. If I now just compile this here and if I now do call and 1000, well, you can see here, we've now got the memory address 200A here as the address that's being loaded in. And that hopefully is going to be our second hello world message after its relocation. And it certainly looks like it is because you can see hello world 234 here, hello world 234 here, message two, which has been relocated as part of the block that was transferred. Now, why would you want to do this is probably what you're asking. Well. Um, one reason that this kind of thing is done is on 16-bit systems, systems with an operating system, code is almost always relocated. To do, um, a few systems like the QL might not, but most relocate the code. Now, fortunately, those kind of systems have a very wide range of capable commands that can do um, relative branches and relative calls to subroutines and things like that. So you, you don't need to worry about it so much as you do with 8-bit systems. But there is another very important reason why you might need to create relocatable code on 8-bit systems, and that is bank switching. You see um, on a lot of these systems, you might need to page out parts of the program that have your normal code in them for you to do other tasks. And one such task that I was doing on Chibi Akamas was I was paging out the block of code that had all of my program in it and paging in the ROM on the um, 464 because I wanted the characters from the ROM to draw them to the screen. But the code that was doing the drawing should have been in the same addressable block, the same 0 to 4000 range. And so what I was doing is I was I was transferring the tiny little block of code that would do that into a spare chunk of the screen memory that was actually unused, paging out the, um, the, the, the code that was my main code, paging in the ROM, getting that code to do the transfer and then unpage it and then return. And then that would, um, it would work fine, but it was a bit of a, it was a bit tricky, but as I say, if you're in a situation where half your memory is used by the screen and the other half is going to have to page out all of a sudden to do a particular job, well, you, you might need to create relocatable code. So again, not something you're going to need in the early days, but something you will need to consider for if you're starting to get cleverer and start to, starting to need to do more advanced things. And really at this point, it's just to make the point that it can be done, um, the difference between absolute and relative jumps and things, and just, just another technique to bear in mind.
Now, today's episode was a bit shorter. Um, there was just a few things left to pick up that hadn't been covered in the previous ones. Next time, we're going to start discussing graphics terminology and all of that kind of wonderful thing. So if you've liked what you've seen, please like and subscribe. As I always say, if you want to support my content, you can buy my book. It's um, called Learn Multi-Platform Assembly with GB Acmas. It covers Z86502, 68,000, and ARM. As you probably know, and it's available on Amazon in print and Kindle. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.